Well, why women um, get economic empowerment and why that is so crucial in terms of having a fungible asset which allows women to make generalised choice, well, why that empowers them both within these special economic zones, something we got no engagement on, all we got was engagement on the demonstrative effect, uh, and uh, why that empowers them more generally outside of these economic zones, although we're not as concerned about this. Then secondly, we've got a discussion about how uh, are women in developing states, and then finally, a discussion about uh, empowering female corporate corporate cultures and empowering women domestically. First of all, however, uh, some rebuttal. So number one, we get the sense that we get a, a, we get a rhetoric of separatism, um, and, and that is bad. And number one, because it's a bad book for children, because we get tokenism. Number one, we suggest that is not true, because at the moment, right, when children observe that men do well, right, they just see it as normal. They see it as men getting promotions, just like it's getting men's promotions over other men. At the point at which children are embedded in a female-centric culture, they will simply see it as normal that women are getting promotions. It's not that men are being screwed over and women are being tokenistic. It's just reversing exactly the same patriarchal assumptions as we currently Point. have. Secondly, we say that that tokenism pro problem exists more stringently under your side, where we have things like explicit quotas, right? The notion that women who become CEOs, even when those quotas aren't formalized, aren't called token women, is <coughs> patent bullshit, right? Even among debating societies, people are like, oh, there's the token girl on the team, right? Even if we don't have explicit quotas. So the notion that it's not feminist tokenism is also untrue. Thirdly, we say that actually, particularly in corporate cultures in which women are specific tokens, they have to point out that they're not tokens, particularly by denigrating the, uh, the, the skills of other women, by saying, you know what, and specifically by masculinizing themselves. So they say, for example, the one of the four women who are on the, foot, the chair of the FTSE 100 company said, women need to realize that having children is not a responsible option. It demonstrates that you are not dedicated to your job. Actually, what women do when you have them embedded in a male corporate culture is they send out a bad message to children because they are forced to appear through a series of implicit norms about what it is acceptable for women to do, and those are male focused. Secondly, we're told that actually we get people who are hostile to women. I hate to break it to you guys, people are hostile to women at the moment, right? Women who do get economically advanced get economically advanced at the cost of their ability to choose, at the cost of their ability to have things like flexible labour hours, at the cost of, for example, being raped by their employer and not reporting it. We say those things already exist. Moreover, we're perfectly happy for these women to stay in special economic zones if we don't get any change. We think at least we're changing the lives for hundreds of thousands of women. We'll expand the programme if we don't get any change externally. Thirdly, we're told that we destroy women's ability to campaign for change. Number one, Women at the top of businesses, who are the only ones we see getting significant progress at the moment, don't campaign for change because they can opt out of social issues when they have loads of cash. They don't need to worry about things like abortion law and reproductive rights because ultimately they can fly to another state if they do it. They can opt out of a lot of discrimination with cash. Women at the bottom who Pat focused on can't do that and they don't get the campaign for change currently by female CEOs. What we need therefore is a change at the lower levels of the labour force where we don't get any of that anti-discrimination law actually being employed in practice. Women don't have the cash, even if those laws are there, to prosecute those cases. Needs something that needs to be engaged with. Thirdly, we're told that we destroy female capital because they exploit each other. Number one, we think of a lot of the forms of exploitation of women in the labour force are because of structural reasons why women's employment in the labour force is slightly different. For example, things like maternity leave, right? Those are impossible to discriminate against women for because they are the only form of labour force. Thus, even if women exploit each other economically, there is a significant series of different types of discrimination which are now like, factually excluded because it is impossible to find any alternative to these people to employ. So, moreover, we say, and I'll talk about this more in a second, in developing states, right, where women just aren't employed in some cases because of religious reasons or cultural reasons which stigmatise women going out into the workforce, again, we change that. Thirdly, we're told that we can discredit women who bicker. It's unclear, again, why, A, we care in a world where women are consistently discriminated against, whether that's true, or B, we need to engage in line with the comparative improvement for all the women in other states uh, in, in these special economic zones is, is worth less. And thirdly, we need some analysis why women actually will bicker more than things like labour disputes, right, which don't need to be framed as bitches having a fight, and if it is, that's probably an indication the world is very misogynistic and we're not going to be getting that far with it. Thirdly, we're told these things will be economically inefficient. Again, unclear why if you're things like tax breaks and subsidies. Oh, something on female ownership. Note this economic activity does mean things like ownership of contracts, tenders, property, and subsidiaries, right? So it does mean that corporations who want to enter these special economic zones have to place women in charge of subsidiary organisations within these special economic zones, uh, empowering them in terms of capital. No, thank you. Now, quickly, very mo moving on very swiftly. Um, 
to economic empowerment more generally. Number one, cash is the most fungible way of getting choice right. At the moment, women do not have cash, uh, and therefore they, they lack choice, CF Pat. So secondly, when they do try and get cash, they have to be employed in things which are owned by men. That means they have to obey, abide by male standards. That means accepting things like discrimination when it occurs. Uh, moreover, even if they do get cash, they then have to feed it back into a male culture which perpetuates the economic imbalances which continue to oppress women. That means that women have to ignore discriminatory practices, not just ignore, but perpetuate discriminatory practices. This model corrects because women are the only labour force and the only ones who get employment, so discrimination and descriptive characteristics is not possible. Moreover, women actually own property because of they have to be CEOs, own subsidiaries, own contracts and tenders. So you forcibly economically empower them. What that means is that if they go out into the wider world, they have that capital to invest in the wider world. Right? Point. They have that capacity to make it from make choice. Go ahead. Is it your case then that no women should seek to be involved in an integrated society? And if so, why? No, we think it's their choice to do so, but we want to offer the op them the option to opt out of an economic structure which is discriminating against them for 2,000 years. Okay, right, so women get to own property. Moreover, we think that it creates that property distribution imbalance more widely because these special, special economic zones will be there. That has a trickle-down effect more generally because women can invest capital into wider states and change corporate culture. Thirdly, we say we empower women in states where they're separate. For example, CF Saudi Arabia. McKinsey has one female employee there. They have to build a separate office for her. We would like to see that more generally, that millions of Saudi women can get jobs and do things like resist discrimination in employment. They're like, hang on, women get beaten if they're rich. That's true, but they have more of an option to opt out. It is still true that disproportionately poor women get more beaten because they don't have that capital to say, I am worth something and if you beat me, I will leave, right? That is it's an additional trap that women get and at least we are changing one of those. Finally, on a female focused corporate culture, we suggest that actually, women may think differently, they may not. They may require different and flexible forms of labour. At the point at which you have a solid female labour force, what you can get is an excellent natural experiment in how actually you might get female focused employment structures and employment practices. We will never get that in a world where companies are focused on profit and averse to experimentation, in particular because they are run by men who are 